Hey everybody, welcome to Wargaming Lab. Today we'll be playing Hearts of Iron 3. Hearts of Iron 3 is a simulator for World War II um, at the strategic level, more than the tactical level. We'll be controlling whole divisions, armies, and army groups. Uh, let's just get right into it. We'll be playing Germany, another uh, candidate, since we get to we fight the whole planet and uh, all that the game has to offer. So, he uh, has multiple stats in guys. We have to start on January 1st, 1936. And the game is uh, stopped, and there's five speed modes. At, at speed one, uh, basically, one hour passes every few seconds. So, you can play it as fast and as slow as you want. Let's just get started. I'll go through the different components of, of controlling our nation. Make sure our country's selected here. Okay, so it's January 1st, 1936. Uh, you can see we're playing as Germany. It's using the more politically correct flag. Start off with map. So the map mode we're in right is called terrain map mode and we're seeing the terrain it's probably slightly simplistic maybe area. You can see that there is forest, there's areas of hills, there's plains and mountains, although not so much in Germany except maybe down here. Uh, the next map mode is simplified terrain, which is a little bit easier to, to digest. You can see greens are forest, uh, urban is Purple, marsh is this sort of dark teal color, uh, plains is beige, and hills are brown. And the reason this matters is all these terrain types give pretty significant positive and negative modifiers to combat depending on the units involved, who's defending and who's attacking, and so on and so forth, and we'll get into that in a bit. The main political map mode that we'll be spending most of our time in is, is like what I just said, it's political. So we can see the country borders um, along with a country color. Germany is dark gray um, and it varies across the world. It doesn't really matter so much what color. Uh, we can see, yeah, basically a sense of what territory is controlled by who. So when we're in combat, this will be pretty helpful. Uh, weather map mode is, um, a little bit harder to discern, you have to pay more attention, and it changes really fast every hour, as you'd expect. Uh, but we can see on uh, midnight of the 1st of January 36, we got some overcast over the lower North Sea and overcast in the Baltic. And if I highlight a specific region like the southern Baltic, we can see that the temperature is just below freezing. We have pressure, wind, humidity, overcast, precipitation, mud, frozen, and, and, and partial clouds. So that tells us a lot about what's going on at this time, moment in time, since we're paused in this territory. And weather, especially in Black Ice Mod, has a significant impact on combat. Intel map gives us a sense of what we can see using the intelligence that we have. Uh, and right now, we can basically see one territory into France and have a, a, a somewhat good idea of the divisions in those neighboring territories. At least we can see the type of division, and we'll go into types of divisions in a bit. Uh, we can also see that they're uh, French divisions from the flag, but we can't see their division name, um, organization, or the d general in charge, basically. Uh, and this varies a little bit depending on how good our intelligence is, and we'll go into the intelligence tab in a minute. Um, revolt risk. So right now, with the political modifiers that we have and the uh, national unity, which I'll describe more in a bit, uh, we have no revolt risk in Germany. Um, we can see that with our intelligence level, we can see the revolt risk in other countries. Right now, for whatever reason, um, the Netherlands or Holland has a pretty high revolt risk. And then, you know, Denmark has a little bit less of one, Poland is mostly okay, uh, Czechoslovakia has a, a higher revolt risk. And that, that's sort of entirely dependent on, on their own national modifiers. Uh, 
the next tab is diplomatic map mode. We can see um, basically our active diplomacy, and right now we don't have any since the game just started. Uh, this will change depending on whether we're at war, and in which case the country will be marked with red. Um, more specifically, the individual territory will be marked with red. Uh, allies will be in green, and um, so on and so forth. There may be another color I'm not thinking of, but we'll, we'll look at that later. Uh, region map mode, uh, I don't spend much time in this region map mode, but it, it just shows you the political regions within the, the world. And this does not require intelligence to see, so I can like, go down to Tunisia and see that this region is named the uh, Siliana region here in uh, light purple. This does somewhat have an effect on the location of victory points, but I, I think it's mostly random. I'll, I'll, we'll go into victory points in a moment. Uh, supply is a big deal. Uh, the green provinces are where we have active supply. I can mouse over Stuttgart, for example, and see that we have maximum infrastructure, 10 out of 10, if that's in the lower right. And with our current technology levels, and there are technologies for logistics and supply, um, we can transport that amount of supplies and fuel per day. We can see where the supply is, uh, origin point is, which is Berlin and that has 13 nodes of travel to get to Stuttgart. And then our current supply in both supply and fuel levels. Um, the requirements for the units that are there, we can see that there's um, no units in that territory, so the supply requirement is very low. Um, I'm guessing that .83 has to do with the anti-aircraft guns that are built there currently. Uh, and then we can see received supply, so that has to do with how much supply was received in the last day, and that'll vary quite a bit depending on how many divisions we have in that, in that province. Uh, infrastructure is directly related to supply, so we can basically see these bright green areas have maximum infrastructure, and if we click on uh, Sonnenberg, we can go down to our infrastructure com uh, component of the uh, province tab, and this province tab shows us all the statistics we need to know about that province, and we can see that our infrastructure is maxed out. So all these slots are, are green, which means that they're used. And uh, you can see that it says this building is built up to level 10, so max. Uh, whereas like right south of it, Coburg, is uh, 7 out of 10. So in theory, this province can transport less supplies and fuel through it if there was a need to transport supplies between, let's say, Nuremberg and uh, Erfurt. One of the most important um, map views is the victory point map mode, and we can see in victory point map mode that um, we have all the territories in green are basically where we have, you can think of them as sort of capture the flags. So these victory points give us points, and you can, mousing over Hanover, you can see in the lower right it says Hanover, Germany, points three. So this province, Hanover, gives us three victory points, and the, the sum of all these victory points, including Berlin, A number, and if that number drops below 50%, our country will basically collapse. So that's one of the goals in combat in this game, is to capture over 50% of your opponent's victory points. And in combination with their national unity value, uh, you can cause a surrender regardless of how many units they have in the field, and that matters a lot. And we'll see why that matters later when we attack the Soviet Union. Uh, theater map mode has to do with our uh, chain of command. So we can see these three division tiles are uh, army theater groups. We have one located in Bielefeld, and then we have one in Berlin, and then we have one in uh, Mosbach. And pardon me if I'm mispronouncing these city and province names. Um, we can see that there's basically three organizational regions for our army. Uh, we don't really need three, and we'll fix that up in a minute. Um, but these are useful for uh, setting up automated objectives, which we will not be doing. We'll be controlling all of our units manually. And what basically this means is if I were to set this theater command to automated and I give it a target of Vienna, it'll use the boundary of this blue military region and the, bound and the border of Austria as sort of a front. And again, we're going to be controlling our units manually, so that's not really much of a... Uh, it's not going to have much of a use in this game. We'll probably size this down to just one military region, and that will basically be our, 
our high command. Uh, error map mode, um, we can see if we were to click on an individual unit, um, I think this is bugged right now, but this is supposed to show the range of the unit. So for, for this transport uh, group of Junkers 52s, we should be able to see their range. The other way I can figure that out is by just clicking on an individual transport plane and going into uh, the stats, and I can see the max speed, supply consumption, fuel consumption, things like that, and there should be a range stat, and I'm not seeing one, so we'll have to come back to this, because I know that that's not right. Let's try a different air unit. Range, 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 range. Well, one way you can sort of trick it is if you pretend you're going to start a mission, so I have this KG enabled. I can try to send them up to the North Sea, and I can see that I can't do any missions that far. Uh, I can try a little bit further south, still can't go that far. Still can't go that far, can't go that far. All right, so there's our range. So that's another way to sort of trick it if the game is a little bit buggy, and it certainly is. Um, we can now see what our mission range is. So I can start a mission in the Frisian coast and, and do these different kinds of missions, and we'll go into this later. Uh, the final three map modes are naval, and na this is pretty simple. It just shows our active trade routes, our active supply routes, and our active naval units. We have none currently at sea. Uh, although it does highlight where our ports are. We'll go into different kinds of units uh, a little bit later in the video. Um, then we have strength. Uh, strength is not super useful. It just shows where you have currently active divisions. And I think it shades this green depending on how strong the forces are in a relative sense, and I'm not entirely sure how it does that. Uh, we can look at that later when we have um, active battles going on. And then finally, resources. So this is huge. Um, not so much in in a day-by-day day sense, but it shows us where our strategic resources are. So we have provinces, as we've seen before. But if I zoom in, I can see that Hanover has a fuel symbol. Uh, Castle or Cassell has um, coal and steel, or metal, it's just called in this game. Uh, Dortmund has steel, coal, and rare materials. Uh, rare materials really just refers to things that are not steel or coal. That could be molybdenum, that could be tungsten, any, anything that's sort of going to end up being a limiting resource in production is sort of uh, lumped into this rare materials stat. And then like I mentioned before, um, fuel, this is crude oil in this case, 7.8 from Hanover. In Germany's case, uh, this is our only fuel, so we have to protect Hanover pretty significantly. Otherwise, strategic bombing will wipe out our only fuel source. We'll, able, we'll be able to convert coal into fuel using uh, coal liquefaction, and I'll go into the technology for that later. Um, but we, we definitely want a, a pure crude source. We'll get uh, some from trade from Romania, and then we'll also be getting some from just straight up conquering territories. So Let's go back to political map mode. I'm going to just go over basically a, a province um, tag really quick, so I'll click on Dusseldorf. We can see a historical photo for Dusseldorf. We can see the neighboring territories, so uh, Dusseldorf in this case has Cleve, Essen bordering um, just on a regular land border, and then we have Krefeld, uh, Cologne, or um, uh, Munchen Gladbach and those three are bordered by a uh, river, so they touch, but there's a river crossing in between, and then Wuppertal over here. Uh, we can see that it's currently night, and we can tell that also by looking at the time of day. Up there. Uh, we can see that the sky is clear, we can see the current temperature, and we can see the current wind speed. And this will vary. I think the symbol and this slider will vary depending on what the wind speed is. We can see the province claims. It's claimed by Germany and no one else. Well, that'll vary depending on what province we're talking about. A good example of that would be Danzig, which is claimed by both Poland and Germany. We can see uh, if there's any objectives, and we can set objectives for AI allies, uh, which basically means, hey, uh, let's say we're allied with Italy, I want you to target uh, this port city in Yugoslavia, and I can assign an objective here. Uh, we can also see any active 
uh, covert missions, so I'll go into covert missions in a bit. It just basically is a way that you can use spies to conduct concrete, like, missions to, in this case, destroy roads or, or so on and so forth. Uh, we can see the, the basic resources in that territory. I've shown you that already. And then um, our intel level, we can see that this is out of 10, I believe. Our, our current intel level in our own territory is 9. Uh, revolt risk is 0. We're getting 6.18 manpower out of this territory, and I believe that's every month. So you could sort of think about that as maybe a, a factor of, of 10. So maybe we're getting... 600 new trained infantrymen or whatever every month from this territory that that's sort of just a, a unitless number but you can think about it that way we're also getting leadership and this is a uh, quantification of basically the technical and scientific expertise that this territory is providing to our our nation and I'll show you in a second, but the sliders that we use to assign leadership and for research, uh, for industry, for production, is all derived from these values. So these ma values matter quite a bit. So if we were to lose Dusseldorf, let's say it's 1945 and the Americans are invading West Germany, we would lose both of these modifiers for our leadership and manpower. We would lose the resources and we would lose all the infrastructure benefit that this city provides. So. Sorry, a quickie water break. I'll be taking a lot of those in this video. It's easier to, to just do that than to do a lot of little mini edits. So bear with me. Uh, anyway, so we, we, just, we just talked about the, uh, the province tab. Uh, we can also see, if we look carefully, that certain province bonuses provide a map element. So we can see for Bitburg, there's a bunker symbol, a fort symbol, and an anti-aircraft symbol. And if we click on the Bitburg, province on the province tab we can see that there's two out of ten pillboxes, two out of ten fortresses, one out of ten anti-aircraft guns, and one out of ten infrastructure. And a good question is, well why is it one out of ten? You can go to the infrastructure map mode. And we can see that this whole region of the SAR is one out of ten infrastructure, and that's a that's a role-playing thing that the game has implemented. Uh, because this territory is up until I believe the 1920s controlled by France as part of the World War I Treaty of Versailles uh, and this one out of ten infrastructure value makes it very difficult for us to move units there and that will change uh, when we implement um, basically reincorporating the Saar into Germany which is a, a uh, like a decision that we will trigger when that arises, which I think is pretty soon, maybe in a couple months. So that's provinces. Uh, let's start looking up at the top bar. Uh, we can see that, yes, we're Germany. We can see the time. We can see how much energy we have in our stockpile, which is 28,000. Uh, again, this is a unitless value. We have 13,000 in changed metal. We have 46,000 rare materials, and then we have crude oil, 13,000. This green number means that the value is increasing and the red value means that the value is decreasing. And you can see right off the bat that we have a pretty significant crude oil problem. Um, and that will be slightly rectified by uh, getting some new trade routes started when the game begins. Um, and it'll also be slowly improved by our technology, uh, but it won't truly be fixed really ever. Um, for Germany in a strategic sense unless we're able to capture Baku, which will be one of our objectives in Operation Barbarossa. Um, this won't, uh, just as, as a note, this won't be a historical run-through. I'm not going to try to do everything exactly when it happened in World War II. Sometimes that'll be possible. Like, I, I have a feeling I'll be able to capture France in 1940, no problem. Uh, we'll have to see about the rest. So I'm going to focus more on just doing what's expedient in the moment. 
So uh, that's resources. So the next major component of this top action bar here is industry. So we can see the little industrial capacity symbol. Uh, this is a, the basically a, a value for all of the production capacity for all of our in industries for the whole country. And we can see that that max value is 159. Now a lot of that is already being used. So this value right here, which is called wasted industrial capacity 52, means that we're basically we have factory lines or factory production lines that are going idle because they're not being assigned work. So we have a about a 52 industrial capacity spare that we can immediately apply to other things. And this value will be modified by um, current political decisions. So you can see here that we're getting bonuses and negatives from current policy and also from the amount of factories that we have. And that could be factories in Germany and it could be factories that we capture in other countries. This base value is the value of our industrial capacity without any modifiers. The 159 is with modifiers. Uh, next over we have supplies. So this is basically everything that our army needs to fight. Uh, it could be ammunition, it could be it could be spare tires, it could be whatever. Um, it's not fuel, but everything else. Uh, fuel is exactly what, what you think it is. It's, it's the the actual aviation and vehicle fuel that we've converted from our, our crude oil. And that's done in um, oil refineries, which I believe we only have one of off the bat. So this value will change a lot, uh, especially when you have units that are actively moving. If they're in motion, they're using a lot more fuel than if they're standing still, which makes sense. Money, self-explanatory, this is what we need to buy and trade. Um, and we gain money by selling things. Once the world war starts and we're kind of isolated, this value is not going to change a whole lot. Uh, I guess it depends on if you're lending money to countries like Italy. Um, this value will obviously depend a lot on what country you're playing to. If you're the United States, you don't have to worry about money basically at all. If you're Germany or Italy or especially minor countries like Italy and Romania, uh, you have to think about your money uh, supply pretty significantly throughout the game. Otherwise, you can grow broke, and that's not good. Um, so moving our way across this taskbar here, we got manpower, and this is uh, 2,211, and I'm sort of thinking about this as the 2,000 being the millions value and the 2 being the 100,000s value. So this is telling us that we have 2,211,000 men in some capacity of being mobilized. If this value r runs down to zero, we can't reinforce our divisions Eventually, they'll run out of men and they'll shatter, and that uh, basically means that that division is destroyed, and we don't want that to happen. I'll go more into that in a bit when we talk about divisions and division movement and division organization. Uh, diplomatic influence, this is basically how much sway we have internationally. This value is unitless as before. Uh, the higher this value, the more diplomatic measures we can take on at any one moment. Espionage of spies, and this literally just means that we have two individual people, like two free spies that we can send out. We'll go into how spies are um, implemented in a moment here. Uh, this value is really important, so this is a ratio. So right now we have 110% of the officers needed to control our military. So. If I mouse over here, we can see that we have 46,900 officers covering 375 brigades, ships, and wings, which means airplanes. Uh, and different kinds of units require different numbers of officers, uh, but we need a certain ratio of at least 38,000 officers in this case to cover all of our units. And every day we're educating 105 new officers. So basically all the military academies in Germany on a monthly basis are outputting a certain number of new of new second lieutenants let's say and then if we divide that by 30 this is how many are graduating on average every day which is 105 and this number won't change much right off the bat but later on when, we, when our divisions start taking losses and we're losing NCOs and officers quite a bit uh, we're going to need to increase this value otherwise our divisions will end up being um, significantly organizationally constrained as their officer ratio drops to enlisted personnel. 
uh, descent is what you think it means. It's like the unhappiness of our people. Um, this value increases to 100. Uh, if our, as this value increases, it's sort of logarithmic. So you'd think if it's out of 100, a value of three or four wouldn't be that bad. But that value of four, let's say, um, is really high because it's going to cause a pretty significant impact on our um, ability to conscript um, our resource output because the factory workers will be unhappy and it has basically far-reaching effects on our entire nation. So we don't want this value to ever go over a couple of points and, and definitely not stay there. It needs to go back down to zero. Uh, this will go up uh, in some ways out of our control as certain like historical events are triggered and it's going to be our job to produce enough consumer goods, which I'll go into in a minute, uh, to offset this value and decrease it. Um, next section is national unity. This is arguably one of the most important stats. So if this value drops below 50%, uh, and that's mostly done by, by losing victory points, but it can also be influenced by strategic bombing. Let's say the Allies are bombing all our cities and our people are... National unity, um, the closer to 50% this gets, the more likely we'll have an, uh, an uncontrolled surrender where we basically, regardless of what we want, our country will just disintegrate um, at values around 50%. So we don't want to there. We can increase this value up to 100% using spies. I'll go into that in a minute. Uh, this is the menu bar. We have a couple of different things that are that are active. So these little icons in this area are sort of active things that are being drawn to our intention. I'll go into those last. Let's go into diplomacy. So this is what you think it means. Uh, we have all of the countries in the world on the left. Uh, whether we're our intelligence anyway is showing that these countries are increasing or decreasing these individual stockpiles, and this is pretty inaccurate. So I don't really pay too much attention to it. We can see our current threat level. So threat is only really important before you declare war, but it shows us how threatened um, this country is of us, or us of them. I think that values those values are averaged into a, into a one out of 100. This central um, diagram basically shows the ideological split of the world. So democracies are up on the top here, which is the Statue of Liberty symbol. Uh, communism is on the lower left, and fascism is on the lower right. And we can see that Germany is the lead member of the Axis. I believe we're the only member in 1936. So we're on the very bottom right because we're a far-right government controlled by the Nazi party. Um, you can see the Soviet Union, which is hiding under this symbol here, is the leader of the Comintern. And there's already two countries that are part of that, Tuvan and Mongolia. And then the UK is the leader of the Allies. The US doesn't join usually until later, as you would expect. So the diplomacy, uh, there's a couple other things we can control here. So for example, let's, let's check out our relation to Italy. Let's scroll down until we find them. Where's Italy? So we can see that we have good relationships with them, so it'll be a negative value if it's, if it's a bad relationship. Um, we have zero threat to them, and they have zero threat to us. Um, their current neutrality is 50%, which is a low value. The closer to zero this gets, the easier it is for them to declare war. And, and that's not really too much of a concern for Germany, because all of the war start events will be automatically triggered. But if we were playing a minor nation like Nepal, for example, we won't even be able to declare war until our um, neutrality values are low enough to to basically allow a declaration of war. And then it shows the country that's of highest threat to them. At the beginning of the game, most of these values will be negative, but once I start the clock a few months in and we've fired a few international events, this value will change for pretty much every country. So we'll check that out again later.
All right, so uh, the next thing uh, over here on the right is decisions. So we can see with Italy that we can do, for any country really, not just Italy, we can do the following actions in diplomacy. We can declare war. You can see by reading that descriptor here that it depends on neutrality to basically be able to do that. We can declare limited war. Uh, the difference between these two is declare war, the top one is a total war, which means that no one surrenders until their victory point derived national unity drops below 50%. So it's basically fight to the death. Um, or limited war where we say, oh, for example, Poland, we just want the region of Danzig. Once we, ca once we capture that, we'll offer a peace. And that peace can be accepted or not. I have pretty limited experience with whether the AI is even interested in, in, in doing brokered pieces under limited war, but for the most part we can just assume in this game that war is going to be total, so they're not going to surrender until we've conquered the majority of their victory points. We can offer alliances. Uh, some of those will be fired by game decisions that we don't have to worry too much about, um, but we can also do this uh, if we decided we wanted to. Let's say our it's 1940 and we're going to go for an ahistorical chain of events and we rather than invading Denmark we've we've used spies to modify their government to the point that they're receptive to an alliance and we can we can do that here so non-aggression pact we can promise not to declare war on them uh, this is mostly for our p-value it doesn't really have any significant repercussions if you break one um, although I believe if you sign one there's a period of time depending on the country where you cannot do a declared war and it'll show you the date where you can then have the option again to declare war. It might be a year from now, it might be six months from now. I'll have to c come back to that uh, with you guys. Uh, ask for transit rights. Uh, that means that all we're allowed to do is move units through their territory. We can't base units there. Um, we can't attack them while we're doing so. Uh, I believe this is a default for when uh, let's say Hungary joins the Axis, we're going to be given transit rights just by default, so we don't have to use diplomacy to do that. Uh, give transit rights is the inverse of that. We can invite people to our faction. Let's say Hungary is close enough aligned to us, like they're down here somewhere in the uh, ideological pyramid, but they have yet to actually join the Axis. We can check here and see if they're able to be invited to our faction. Embargo will... Uh, cease all trade immediately with that country. We're not going to really do that as Germany. Just by declaring war, uh, embargo is default. We can buy production licenses. So let's say, for whatever reason, Italy has a much more advanced medium bomber than we do. We can buy a production license for a, a defined amount of runs, which means like we buy five runs, i.e. five squadrons or five individual aircraft of that plane from Italy, and then we have to pay them money to have the rights to do that. Um, allowed debt means that we can run a negative balance, so if Italy is trading with us and we're, we run out of, out, of, out of money for whatever reason, but we still want to be getting oil from them, uh, the game will track how much we owe them through time. I think this is kind of a broken tool because uh, I've seen op many, many times where Japan has, we've allowed debt to Japan as Germany and because of the way the game works they're never going to really pay us back because it assumes that the payback will happen after the war is over and for the majority of the game's useful time the war is active so we're basically giving them free, free resources so think about it that way rather than debt that will be paid back because it won't be Influence nation, uh, that means that we can use spies, so let's say I want to bring Portugal into the Axis, I can send 10 spies to Portugal, and we can use those spies to overwhelm their counterintelligence ability, we'll go into that when we get to the intelligence tab, and because we've overwhelmed their counterintelligence ability, we can task those spies to cause a, a drift of their national uh, political ideology towards the Axis, so that's what that does. And then offer trade agreement, we can offer individual trades for metal or rare materials, and so on and so forth. Often I'll let the AI do that, um, but 
you know, there's specific cases where it makes a lot more sense to do it yourself. And then finally, in the lower right, these are all of the automated decisions that occur. And we can see that all the checkboxes except for the top three are grayed out. Uh, if we mouse over the the white text, we can see a little description of what that what that meant in reality. Uh, this is the Anschluss of Austria. We can see that it occurred, you know, historically on the 12th of March, 1938. We can usually trigger this much earlier, depending on Australia, uh, Austria's national unity, um, the amount of spies that we have in their country, and the, the drift that those spies have caused. We can see uh, the requirements for this to fire, and none of those requirements are met right now. Um, our party, the National Socialist Party, doesn't have a population of 50 or above 50. Uh, we don't have the modifier political crisis in Austria, and we don't have the date requirement, which is March 1st, 1938. But you'll, you'll see in a minute that um, it says one of them falling must be true. We're going to be able to get a lot of these to be true before March 1st, 1938. So we can be a little ahistorical with these historical decisions. And this, this little button here, if I could click it, would fire that event. And it has the following downsides. We gain Austria, but we gain descent, and we gain a, uh, we lose foreign relation to the following countries. You can see that described there. Uh, production is, is one of the main screens we'll be spending a lot of time in. This is where we apply our industrial capacity to the building of units. And we can see that as soon as we launch the game, there are units that are already being built. And we're going to modify this right off the bat. We can build uh, land units, naval units, and air units. Um, we can also build nuclear weapons later. I'll go into that in a much later video. Uh, again, we have our resources here. It's a little bit easier to see in this in this window. We can see our active trade routes, of which we have none. We can, you can see the gain and loss in these individual resources. We can see our active convoys. These are not trade convoys. These are supply and resource convoys to to ourself. So like. Uh, Konigsberg and East Prussia to Stettin is transporting with one transport unit uh, coal, metal, rare materials, and fuel. And then we have the su supply transports between these cities here. We can create and remove convoys if we decide to do this manually, which we will later because the AI will automate trade routes even once we've declared war and we'll be losing convoys for no reason, so I'll be manually controlling this later. Uh, we can see that we have 71 transport merchant fleet, whatever you want to call it, ships available. We have four escorts, so you can think of those as like uh, frigates or, or mine layers or whatever ship is going to be tasked to defending convoy ships, and we'll be building both of these mostly for creating supply routes to the front uh, in the Baltic Sea for Germany. Uh, for the US and Japan and the UK, this is a much more involved process because we'll be trading across the, trading and providing supplies to our units across the entire planet, so. Uh, this slider tab is, is, is one of the more important tabs in the game, so we can see again that we have 159 industrial capacity and we're able to apply that capacity to upgrades upgrading units, um, reinforcing units as they gain, as they experience losses in, the, in battle, um, also to the elements. We can like we lose infantry at a steady rate during the, the peak of winter, regardless of whether they're in combat. I think that's kind of cool. Supplies, production, consumer goods, so this is like just grocery, grocery supplies and other things for our, our citizens. And then land lease, which is basically the uh, way the game models like we're giving land lease to Italy i.e. Italy's collapsing we decide before we take the step of invading Italy and taking it over we're going to give them a bunch of free tanks that's what that value means flotilla and air wing builder we have the ability in some cases to build underground resistance Germany, we don't do that, but you can do that as the UK. We can 
For example, is if we were playing the UK, we could build resistance cells in France this way. And then we have our theater forces, uh, which is basically a way of showing, okay, the general who's in charge of this military theater thinks we should build the following things. This is a little bit buggy and not very fleshed out. You can see right now that all the generals think we need to build a median bomber. I don't think that's accurate. That's not good advice. We can just ignore this. And then here, uh, this is our production tab. So we can see what's currently being built. Uh, the unit being built is displayed here. We can cancel these orders using, using these X buttons over here. We can see the date of the estimated finish of this, of this project. So Admiral Hipper is currently being built. It's expected to finish on 1937, April 29th. Currently 100% of this project is moving forward at full speed because it's got uninterrupted access to 5.62 industrial capacity. And we can change the order of the build using these buttons. The reason I mentioned uh, the 100% of industrial capacity is if we move back down to Z10 Hans Lodi, which is a destroyer, we don't have enough industrial capacity applied to this project. We only have 83% of the, of the max. So this project, although it will finish eventually, is, is finishing slower, i.e. 83% um, of the speed that it could be finishing at. And then in red are projects that are tasked but have no IC available for their construction. Let's go into the uh, division builder real quick. So this is the division. Um, we have the available regiments or brigades in the list here. And these stats show the strength for that unit. So this motorized infantry regiment has 6,000 men in it. It has a base organization of 76, and all that that really means is we don't want it to drop to zero, otherwise they're, they're completely combat ineffective. It has a combat width of one, which is sort of imagine um, a line of trenches in World War I, you're on one side, the enemy's on the other. What's the width of that trench line that a single regiment, i.e. motorized infantry in this case, can effectively engage in combat? So if you have one regiment of infantry, we could maybe expect that that regiment could engage in effective combat across a one and change mile frontage. Whereas if we expected this regiment to uh, have a impact on a wider area, um, they wouldn't do as good of a job. And then the converse side is, let's say we have a full division of motorized infantry and tanks and they have a combat width because it's it's the sum of these values so let's say they have a combat width of five and they're fighting a russian infantry division that has a combat width of three what that means is we because our combat width is greater we can get around them but also we can't necessarily engage every one of those russian units at the same time because our units are out of position. So we can think about combat with that way, and I can go into that in more, more detail later. Uh, soft attack, uh, we can think of that as um, their small arms combat effectiveness. So that could be um, rifles, it could be machine guns, it could be mortars, uh, it could be light artillery. A hard attack is their ability to engage armored vehicles and structures, so that value is, let's say, Pack 36 light anti-tank guns. It could be um, a hand-carried uh, Panzerfaust later in the war. This value will change quite a bit based on our technology level. Uh, piercing attack is, so hard attack is the value basically of damage that that does once it pierces, but it has to pierce first. Uh, it's sort of similar to Dungeons and Dragons that way. Uh, this piercing value determines, okay, if the enemy tank has an armor value of 5, we need at least a piercing attack of 5, preferably 6, to penetrate that, that target. Armor, okay, how much armor we have. So this is a, a, a soft-shelled truck-mounted infantry regiment, motorized infantry, so they have an armor value of 0. If they were Panzer Grenadiers, they would have an armor value because they'd be going into combat in uh, half-tracks. They have limited anti-air attack. Uh, you can think of that as maybe machine guns mounted on the trucks. It's, it's, it's there, but it's not very much. Uh, defensiveness is their ability to resist um, being hit while in defense. 
So you could think of that as like their digging ability, um, their camouflage ability all kind of lumped into one value. Their toughness is the same value but when they're on the attack. So how good that unit is at attacking and avoiding being hit at the same time. Uh, air defense is their ability to, re to avoid being hit by air units. And this value is meshed with their, um, not meshed, but it's the converse of their air attack. So they're not attacking air units, but this is their ability to be, uh, avoid, basically to avoid being hit by air units. Their softness uh, is sort of related to how much armor they have, so basically their ability to avoid damage, and the, the literal definition is it influences the number of soft and hard attacks that a uh, brigade receives, so they're going to receive 90% of all soft and hard attacks thrown at them because they have very limited armor. Their uh, speed in kilometers per hour their suppression, zero, this is this is the ability to reduce partisan activity, and there's specific units that do that. They consume 1.6 supplies per day, they consume 2.5 fuel per day, they take 153 officers to function properly, the build cost for this brigade is 100 and, sorry, 16.07 across the life of the build the build time, or how long it takes to build. Um, the manpower cost is 4.6, and then the time to build is 185 days. And that includes training, so it, we don't have to leave units in Germany to train. Once they're built, it's sort of modeled that they've both been produced and trained in the field, and all that they need to do is gain organization, which they'll do both as they travel to the front and before they enter combat. So, uh, building a, a unit, uh, there's, there's some pre-built pre here. Um, I usually, I'll use a few of them and I'll, I'll avoid the rest. We can build our own. So let's say we want to build an infantry division. As Germany, we have very limited access to fuel, so we want our infantry divisions to be mostly fuel use free. Black Ice uses a, a main regiment and then all the supporting brigades are, are not so much combat facing, um, in some cases they are like an anti-tank brigade. But we also need to model the um, units that are used for supply, for command, and for anti-aircraft, for example. So we have to basically outline the entire order of battle of this division. So we'll start with an infantry regiment. We can see that the division right off the bat already has 9,000 men and it has these combat values. It, as, as it currently stands, it'll take this much resources and days to produce. We have our infantry division uh, regiment. We want to add anti-tank ability. We've done that now. We can see that we can have a max of seven regiments or brigades in this division. We're out of two right now. We want to add engineers. We want to add artillery. We want to add some kind of recon element. Uh, so later in the game, this would probably want to be armored cars um, because they have a low softness value. But in the beginning of the game, we don't have enough fuel to support that, so we're going to start off with recon cavalry. And then we we see that we have five brigades out of seven. Um, but now I'm going to draw your attention to uh, combined arms bonus. So right now it's zero, and the reason for that is we don't get any combined arms bonuses until we have a headquarters unit. So let's add that. It's right here, Division Headquarters. And we can see that we've unlocked these combined arms bonuses. So we have to have a Division Headquarters. We have to have a maneuver unit. In this case, it's infantry. We have artillery and direct fire enabled. We have recon and assault. And now we just need a transport ability. So we can think about this division right now as it currently stands as infantry, artillery, anti-tank, and recon and engineers and uh, headquarters, but without the ability to logistically move across the battlefield, other than you know the short distances that they can walk um, un unsupplied. So we need to add some kind of transport element. For Germany, it's going to be horses right off the bat. So Germany doesn't have the ability to fully motorize its units really ever. Uh, later in the game, if we're able to capture most of the Soviet Union, we could slowly start changing that. Uh, but most of our units will be um, 
fully unmotorized except for the, the couple of panzer divisions and motorized divisions that will dedicate to that specific purpose. I can remove regiments here if I change my mind. And we can see as I do that there's sort of a unit card for each brigade. Uh, this is the current technology for artillery that we have. Uh, here's our current anti-tank gun. This is, this is influenced by our technology level which I'll go into next. We can see our current recon cavalry technology, engineers, there's our historical photo for a horse-drawn logistics, and our uh, division headquarters. I'll come back to this uh, production slide in a minute once we finish talking about all the major tabs. Uh, technology is where we do what, what, what it sounds like. We, we re, uh, research technology. So there's, there's areas of theme here. So there's national technologies, there's land forces, which is like small arms and artillery and armor technologies, there's air forces, engine technology, um, different kinds of planes, plane armament, bomb load, air systems, avionics, and jet. Naval forces, submarines, escorts, which is like destroyers and frigates, transports, cruisers, capital, and carrier. Do uh, land doctrines, uh, or, or air and, and sea doctrines. So these are like, rather than individual like rifle or engine technologies, this is like how well are, are our generals versed in elastic defense? And we can see that our technology level currently is zero because we haven't researched one out of six uh, 1938 spec elastic defense. And there's a description for each of these technologies below. These numbers here, eight, six, and so forth, basically outline how difficult that technology will be to and we can see that this is a value of 8 out of 10, which basically means in 1936 it would be a waste of our scientists' effort to try to research this because it would be too difficult. We should wait till 1938. That's what that means. The converse of that is uh, Sverpong technology, which means sort of the critical point. Um, it's a 1918 technology that we can research, and we definitely want to research it because the benefits are really high, but it's a very difficult technology to research. So we're going to have to devote some of our smartest scientists to this battlefield doctrine right off the bat, even though it's very difficult to research. Uh, we can see that there's four broad areas of research. So there's Blitzkrieg, Deep Battle, Grand Battle, and f Superior Firepower. So these are different ways of thinking about warfare. So uh, Germany and the German general staff between World War I and World War II advocated for the Sverpunk doctrine, which, which sort of means that we need to use overwhelming force in specific areas of the battlefield to achieve local superiority, and that will allow us to get behind the enemy and destroy them. Uh, that's called Blitzkrieg, which is more of an English word that was used for this doctrine, uh, and that, that name stuck in, in the history books. Uh, deep Battle is a Soviet uh, theoretical battlefield doctrine um, for accomplishing kind of the same thing as Blitzkrieg. Break through the enemy's line with, with overwhelming force and get into their, their strategic depths and mess up their ability to supply and do command and control. Uh, grand Battle is a more traditional approach to using artillery, tanks for infantry support, and infantry, mass infantry, and, and, and sort of a World War I uh, concept to break through the enemy and defeat them in detail. This is used for pretty much every nation besides Germany, the U.S., and the USSR. And we, we can see that we can research certain things within these trees, but these trees will not be unlocked unless we're basically assigned off the bat to these doctrines. And that's done at, at the game level by country, so that's not entirely in our control. And then superior firepower um, is, is the basic uh, military thought doctrine for the United States. And this is... Um, 
we're just going to overwhelm the enemy with a, with a just ridiculous amount of artillery, air power, and uh, small arms um, combat power uh, in the field and just destroy enemy units outright. Uh, so we don't have to worry so much about more complex tactics. If we just destroy the enemy with superior firepower, we can win the battle. So that's what this uh, strategy involves. Um, we have naval doctrines, air doctrines, operational doctrines. Th these are available to all nations. And this is, you know, infantry, command and control, training, combined arms, mobile, tank, and so forth. Special, uh, these are triggered by uh, specific events. So for Germany, we'll get access to things like the Tiger, and this will provide bonuses to like heavy armor units and other things like that. If we're the United States, we're going to eventually get access to the P-51 Mustang, and, and that just provides sort of bonuses to existing fighters by, uh, in this particular case, giving them longer mission ranges. And there's, uh, there's many others. We can go into those later. Uh, chain of Command is basically improving the ability of our brigade, division, corps, army, and other headquarters units to disseminate orders. Uh, and the bonus of better ability to communicate orders is we get reduced delay between attack. And then we get some bonuses to like radio strength, um, encirclement, and backhand blow. And I'll go into what these specific battlefield um, like combat effects mean when we get into into combat. But basically the better these command structures are, the more likely these bonuses will apply in battle. And then brigade strength. So later on we'll be able to modify the, the size of our individual brigades. Like let's say that in 1936 an infantry brigade has 6,000 men, we can modify that to increase that to nine to 10,000 later if we see the need to have a larger infantry division for whatever reason. Uh, the top bar is where we, uh, similar to industrial capacity, we can assign our leadership to specific tasks. So right now, of the 59.4 leadership Germany has available, we can assign, are currently assigning 14.8 of it to research, a similar amount to espionage, which is basically spy production, the same amount to diplomacy, uh, producing diplomacy points and then to officers. So right now it's it's sort of just a starting value where these are all equal. We'll be modifying that in a minute. Uh, politics. So this is um, unlike diplomacy where we're focusing on exterior effects of our government. This is the internal government page. We can see that our country is currently controlled by the Nazi party and we can see that uh, it's easy to think of this pie chart as, as like seats in, in the parliament or seats in the house. This is just popularity. So right now, 36% of all Germans uh, favor the National Socialist Party. 33% uh, of them favor a, a similar fascist party, but it's the DVFP. And then a much smaller proportions favor other parties. And these colors are, are based on uh, ideological leaning, so the Nazi party is, is beige, fascist parties are in gray and black, liberal parties are in blue and purple, and then communist and um, socialist parties are in shades of, of maroon and red. So This has nothing again to do with who has seats in government or who has say in government. Right now we're a one-party state, this government has no elections, so the Nazi party is entirely in control. We can adjust these popularity values using um, both triggered events and spies. We can see um, our head minister, so Adolf Hitler is head of state. He provides these bonuses, um, head of government, minister of foreign affairs, and so on and so forth. Uh, chief of staff and chief of army have some effects that have a big impact on land battles. We'll go into that more later. We can see the strategic effects that are currently occurring. Um, right now there are none. I'll go into that more later. Uh, we can adjust laws. So right now we're a totalitarian, totalitarian system. There are no elections. It's a one-party state. Right now our military service length, service length is a three-year draft. 
We currently are fully mobilized, even though we're not at war yet. We're um, currently doing a massive educational investment, and we can decrease this. There's benefits and cons to both. Generally, I don't mess with this. Massive education is usually the best way to go. Um, industrial policy, right now we're consumer product oriented. We can change this to mixed industry and heavy industry later. Those have positive and negative effects. We can adjust the training uh, regimen for land, air, and naval forces. Uh, generally, as a major nation like Germany, the US, or British, or the Soviet Union, you, you leave this as a specialist. Uh, there are specific reasons you won't do that, like the Soviet Union, um, right after Barbarossa, you want to basically churn out divisions as fast as possible. So in that case, for a limited period of time, I would probably bump it down to um, basic training, just to get divisions out faster. And then conscription laws. So this has to do with um, whether conscription is sort of in effect at all or, or not. So we could have a volunteer army, which means we would have less men available, but we'd have higher industrial capacity. The way you can think about that is there's more men in the factories to contribute to that, rather than being mandatorily in the army. Um, I usually leave this as extended uh, conscription. Uh, again, an example I can think of where you'd want massive conscription would be the Soviet Union, uh, when you just need men as fast as possible. So that's politics. Um, intelligence is where we apply spies on an individual country basis and also on a mission basis. So right now we have 137 spies abroad. We have two spies that are unassigned and then we have five spies that are assigned to um, internal domestic duties. Uh, right now partisans have a negative five efficiency within our country. That's great. It means that they're very unlikely to succeed. This value will show us how many spies we've caught and then our current neutrality, as I explained earlier. So if we wanted to apply our available to spies, we can use these buttons down here to um, query the countries of the world. Let's say we want to put spies in Austria, because we want to switch them to uh, our side as soon as possible. I'll click on Austria. We can see that we have currently three spies already in Austria but that our priority for Austria is, is zero. So these spies are, we can just assume that they were there before the game started. If we want to put more spies there, we need to assign a maximum priority value and then assign the missions. So we're going to say that the top priority for our spies is to support our party, party which is the uh, Nazi party. So this will slowly create an increase in popularity for that party. Um, that's our top priority. Our second priority will be to disrupt national unity. So that's a two out of three. And then our final priority will be counter espionage. So this will basically be uh, countering their own spies. And we can only assign three of these at a time because there's only three priority values. And uh, because we only have three out of 10 available spies, our information about Austria is pretty limited. We can see that they have 29 industrial capacity. We can see that they have a manpower value and so on and so forth. These values we can think about as 30% accurate. So I don't trust these values until there's 10 spies in that country. So I only have a 30% confidence in this value. It's probably not completely wrong, but it's only 30% accurate. That's how you can think about it. These values will also change so fast once the game started that we don't need to spend so much time looking at them. The most important value is, uh, let's say for the Soviet Union, um, it's December 1941, and we've captured Moscow. We can get a sense of, if we have 10 spies active, how uh, close their national unity value is to 50%, and that'll allow us to um, get a, a gauge on how close they are to surrendering. It's not a, it's not a perfect estimate of that, but it helps. Um, with four spies in the country, they have 100% national unity, which I'm guessing is not entirely accurate, but it's close. And then uh, the rest of the values, as I mentioned before. Uh, the theater tab, um, again, this is a tab we're gonna spend next to no time in, but this is where the generals in charge of the theater forces tell us what divisions they need, although it's actually more specific than that. They're telling us what brigades they need, and naval, and air, 
and we can just ignore this because they're usually wrong. Uh, this statistics tab shows us information about individual uh, units in our military, so we can see a list of every brigade in, in the Wehrmacht, which is um, honestly too much information, but it's interesting to see that. We can see um, individual ministers and their um, their ideological association and what they're doing. And this is also generals, it's not just uh, ministers. For example, we can see that Hitler is in the Nazi party and there's three of Hitler because he has three different personality traits. Obviously there's only one Hitler, but we can see three of him because he has these different personality traits. And his job is uh, head of state. And he's a power-hungry demagogue, of course he is. Uh, we can look at Gustav Krupp. He's a tank proponent, so he's in charge of the Krupp company. And he is in two parties. I'm not sure how accurate that is, but he's both a member of the Nazi party and he's a more of an old-school old fascist. We can also look at our economy. This is just a list of every province in our country and what it's providing to our economy. Leipzig is providing those you know, resources. And then overview, we can mostly ignore. It's just every country in the world and there are victory points available. We can sort of use this if we wanted to um, track victory points. And, and this tab, unlike our intelligence-based tabs, is accurate always. So we can look at the Soviet Union right now and remember maybe in a couple years that, hey, in 1936, the Soviet Union had 198 victory points. So we can do some math and say, oh, it's 1943 and we're pretty deep into the Soviet Union and we check this list and we see that their victory points are around 99 or 98 and that tells us that they're about halfway through their victory points and they might be close to capitulation. Um, so this is a pretty important value but we're not going to check it very often. Strategic, uh, this is where we can track the convoys and uh, strategic bombing and other losses to industrial capacity that are going to that are going to influence the strategic warfare value and this strategic warfare value in addition to victory point loss is the only other way to modify national unity so this is important so in theory if we were to sink like 98 percent of all of the uk's convoys this would have a big impact on their national unity I guess modeled on the fact that they're not getting any food from the rest of the empire, that it could cause them to capitulate purely from this, which was one of the objectives of Germany that they failed at in World War II. So. Uh, finally, before we end this video, um, we can look at laws to be enacted. So that brings us back to the, um, the politics tab, and we can see that it's telling us that more efficient laws can be enacted, and it's telling us that mixed industry can be enacted. So we're just going to go ahead and click this. Are you sure you want to enact the law? Yes, I am sure. And then it gives us a little bit of a heads up and says that we now, because we've switched to mixed industry, we're going to gain more money. We're going to gain a decrease in consumer goods during wartime, which means that our, our civilians are okay with 10% less consumer on a daily basis. Um, peacetime, that effect is even greater. However, the unit recruit time goes up. So we can think of that as, uh, oh, we've moved more guys out of consumer industry into an increase in wartime industry, and now it's going to take a little bit longer to recruit units because more guys are stuck in the factory. And then efficiency is a value sort of over 100%, so this is basically telling us that we're now 101.5% um, effective at production, so a 1.5% increase from where we were before. And we can say OK to that. And we'll just check, make sure we're not missing anything. It's saying research is still possible. We'll go into that in the next video. It's saying that there is IC wasted and that there's national decisions available. And these national decisions, uh, there's a few that start off at the beginning of each game that'll set up sort of the stage for the world as it were in 1939 of January. 
there will be some decisions about game difficulty that will go into in the next video, and then we get to make some decisions about um, the organization of our military and a few other uh, small decisions. And then at that point, we're ready to uh, click play. So uh, with that, I will end the video. Um, this has been a quick overview of the game user interface, um, mostly just in terms of production, diplomacy, technology and intelligence, uh, how resources are tracked, and uh, the next video will go into more detail on recruiting units, how units are issued orders, how they move, and uh, we'll probably click start on the clock too. So thank you for watching. I appreciate you all uh, spending the time checking out my video. And if you liked the video, hit the thumbs up button. And uh, feel free to leave a comment if you noticed I left anything out. Uh, thanks again, and I'll see you guys in the next one.